We are going to talk about eating Jesus' wisdom. We've already heard some discussion about wisdom already, which is great. And <clears throat> Jesus teaches that we should feed on him and then live forever. Right? John 6, 57. I live because my Father, he who feeds on me, right? This is, this is his explanation of why he said, I am the bread of life. And they're all looking at him going, you don't look like bread, right? And, and he just kept saying, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. You have to eat me. And it's like, that's just crazy. What is he talking about? He said, the words are spiritual and you've got to understand them spiritually. You've got to feed on my thinking, my words, my teaching. And, and they will live because of me. Next verse, 58. <clears throat> this is the bread from heaven. He who eats this bread will live forever. Okay, there's the, there's the catchphrase live forever right two billion people actually more than two billion people want to live forever right and the two billion people are satisfied with easter right that they're going to live forever they're going to die and instantly go to heaven and they're going to live forever but whenever you see live forever in the bible you need to hold up hold them horses there and double check that you know exactly what jesus is teaching about live forever huge numbers of people want this live forever and never die again um, because living is good for most people sadly a few people commit suicide because they can't stand it any longer but but if their lives were better they would want to live forever so whenever we see the live forever mentioned in the bible we should all focus deeply and be asking do i understand the forever words right and sadly two billion people don't they do not understand what jesus is teaching about it five verses after that jesus explained that spiritual understanding of his words is the key to our eternal life so so you need the spirit you need to be baptized you need to god's have have god's holy spirit to understand what's going on because you know, the Spirit gives life. The words that I speak are spiritual words, and they are life, meaning life eternal. So in practical terms, how do people feed on Jesus? This is a question everybody should ask themselves when they read through that, that verse. Feed, he who feeds on me. Okay, how do we feed on Jesus? Logically, we need to pay close attention to his words. Well, one is in, in unleavened bread, we feed on bread that's not mixed right <coughs> which <clears throat> okay here's a quick question for you which is the most difficult of the seven annual festivals to explain to somebody takes the most amount of time to explain to them is it passover not really because in in different ways one it's in the news people say happy passover and happy easter it's like both of them mixed together there right and and most people have read the passover scriptures and they understand the lamb passover lamb they we sing about the lamb of god just a little bit ago right so it doesn't take a lot to explain the basics of passover what we do on passover right we eat the wafer we drink the wine we wash feet done right there's a lot more explanation goes along with it okay um trumpets doesn't take a lot of explanation right uh, atonement doesn't take a lot of explanation i mean you can go deep right but but there's somebody on the street that says well what are your seven right okay feast of tabernacles that's just like a church convention for eight days right oh oh yeah and then the eighth day day eight right uh, second resurrection okay that doesn't take a lot of explanation and and what do we do on the eighth day there's no symbolism. There's no eat this, do this, wash this, comb your hair this way. There's no, there's no ritual, right? And But unleavened bread, it's like, say what? It's like, what are you talking about? What is that? Where can you buy some? <laughs> Hello, bakery, I want some unleavened bread. <laughs> what? What's the matter with you, right? But, but it's the most difficult to explain right and 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 it's it's seven days of stop your routine how many of you like toast in the morning me yay toast right toast the peanut butter yeah. 
right? Okay, for seven days, it's like, or eight or nine, if I'm traveling, right? It's like, no toast, okay. How can I, what can I put peanut butter on? <laughs> Back of, on a spoon. <laughs> okay, not the sun, the sun. Okay, so God spoke a power punch for learning in Proverbs 2, 6. The Lord gives wisdom. Okay, we need wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. These are the big three. If you go through the book of Proverbs with your teenagers or young people, you're going to see wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Which comes first? Anybody? Which one is the starter? Knowledge. Knowledge. Right? If you don't have the right knowledge, you can't understand it. If you've got the wrong knowledge, if you've got Easter, if that's your knowledge, you've got the wrong knowledge. Now, how do you understand Easter? Bunnies, Easter eggs, you know, uh, sunrise services, right? So, so you can't, you have to have the right knowledge, then you have to apply the understanding to the right knowledge, and then wisdom is doing the understanding of the right knowledge. It's, it's a, like a combination of all three. So two chapters later we read Proverbs 4, 7, Wisdom is the principal thing. It's the number one thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. And two billion people are reading their Bibles, but not asking, do I understand this verse? Right? And, and we discussed earlier in 1 John, it says, he who commits sin is of the devil. Is most Bibles. Right? And it's like... <clears throat> Do I understand that verse? And I hung up on that a couple of weeks ago. It's like, wait a minute, John, you can't say that. All the God's church people commit sin. They're all of the devil. Therefore, there are no God people, right? It makes no sense. So I went digging and I found a couple of Bibles that say, those who practice sin are of the devil. Ah, okay. Now we got, now we got an understanding. Verse 8, exalt her wisdom, exalt wisdom, the principal thing, and she's going to promote you. How many want to be promoted, right? In everything, in our, every aspect of life, how do you want your family to be promoted, your grandkids to be promoted? You want promotion, then it's through wisdom and God, you know, honoring that wisdom and helping you with that wisdom. This is the great advice for basic living. Right? A teenager not in the church could benefit from reading and studying Proverbs and never going to church. He could benefit from it because there's a lot of good basic understanding there, right? But even greater still for advancing towards eternal life. Paul teaches that Jesus became our wisdom, right? Essentially his words, right? Given from God, 1 Corinthians 1.30. In Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, many things, and grace. We sang two, two songs earlier, both mentioned grace. And that's what, the, that's what Passover is. It's the grace. Because there was a Passover, because Jesus shed his blood, that grace allows our penalty for our sins to be pardoned and passed over, right? So, hearing and obeying Jesus are the starting point for wisdom and eternal life. If you want eternal life, get wisdom. Under, you know, and if you want wisdom, get true knowledge. And if you want that, get understanding of the true knowledge. Jesus himself warns all of his followers who read their Bibles about half listening to his words. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Okay, in nowadays, it's Jesus, Jesus, right? Not everybody who's, who claims Jesus as their master, their Messiah, their Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God. Uh-oh, why not? What went wrong? What's the problem here, right? But he or those who do the will of the Father in heaven. So we've got to find out what is the will of the Father in heaven. Well, the Father in heaven gave Jesus a whole string of words and messages to come down to earth and to give those words to us. They're the words of the Father. They're not the words of Jesus. He's just repeating what the Father told him to say. 
So they're the Father's words. That's the will of the Father. Jesus is speaking to sincere people. I don't, you know, I don't want to in, in, you know, suggest that two billion Jesus-following people are insincere. They want to love Jesus. They don't have the knowledge to be, and they don't understand the true knowledge to be able to have the wisdom to truly love Jesus the way he wants to be loved. Right? I only hear some of what Jesus is teaching. Right? And, and they, you know, it's like they take a few. One, <clears throat> one great evangelist out there is saying that the thief on the cross is proof that you go to heaven when you die. Right? Now that's a stretch. <laughs> that is a big, long stretch. But he says it in such a way that people just accept it. They don't examine the thief on the cross and realize it can't possibly be the way it's written because Jesus was dead and in the tomb for three days and three nights. So where was the thief? Was he in the tomb three days and three nights? And if so, was that called paradise? That <laughs> doesn't fit very well, right? So anyhow, Jesus continues in Matthew 7, 22. Many will say, Lord, Lord, Jesus, Jesus, have we not prophesied in your name? Yes, they had. Cast out demons in your name. Yes, they had. Done many wonders in your name. Been on TV all around the world. Held, held conventions and held, you know, gone and seen people and done stuff. Yes, they had. But they weren't doing the will of the Father. So they didn't make the first cut. They were doing some of Christ's teachings, but not. they failed to understand how pra the practicing part is the most important part. Don't be hearers only of the word, be doers of the word, right? Which means you have to very carefully hear what the word says and then carefully do what the word says. And bingo, you've got seven days of unleavened bread, right? Pretty easy, pretty easy for people around the world to eat a wafer and drink a little wine and pat themselves on the back and say, Yay! I did Passover, I did communion, I do it every month, right? How good am I, right? And it's not Passover wafer if you don't do it on Passover night, right? So next verse, Jesus says, Then I will declare to them, right? It's Matthew seven twenty three. I will tell these people who have done all these things in my name, and it's true, he doesn't deny they had done that, right? I never knew you. Oh, wait a minute. They've been preaching Jesus from the Bible. How can he say, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who, here comes the clincher, practice lawlessness. Uh-oh. What on earth can that mean? What is a practice lawlessness? Right? Well, if you're driving down the street, you come to a four-way stop. How do you practice lawlessness? You don't stop, <laughs> right? Or speed limit signs. How do you practice lawlessness? Go 10, 20 over, right? But anyhow, when it comes to human levels, there's many, many laws, and we know there's many, many laws, and as we know how we see people break a law. I love the one that says, road work ahead, and then the sign says, do not pass. The instant I see do not pass, I look in my mirror for the two or three cars that are about to pass me. <laughs> and they, they never fail. This, you know, they're always there. It's like, here they come. Give them some room. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Right? Do you know what do not pass means? But anyhow, it's, it's the way it is. But when it comes to God's law, it's like, oh, no, he doesn't want to give us laws. Oh, what happened to the Ten Commandments? Were, were they not kind of laws? You know. So later, the Apostle John would write in 1 John 3, 10, In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Okay. Unleavened bread, because it's taught in the Old Testament, it's taught in the New Testament. Unleavened bread is practicing righteousness. It's one little piece of the truth. 
Paul taught it to the Gentiles. Jesus did it. Um, you know, so you can't get around that unleavened bread for seven days is practicing righteousness. It's just one of them, right? You can do that well and then fail someplace else, but at least you need to do the days of unleavened bread the way it's taught in the Bible. Jesus is watching everyone to see if they practice righteousness or if they practice lawlessness. And practicing lawlessness, lawlessness can be as easy as not doing what God said. So how many of you think two billion people are practicing lawlessness by not keeping the days of unleavened bread? The book says do it. God says do it. If you don't do it, you're practicing lawlessness in the sense that for seven days you practice it, and then every year you practice it for seven days. Right? So the wisdom from Jesus' words is how you choose lawlessness or righteousness makes all the difference for living forever. Jesus had Paul explain that obedience to Christ's words is needed for eternal life. Oh, no, not obedience, right? And there's lots of people who don't want to be obedient to anything. Romans 1, 5. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith. Unleavened bread is part of the faith. Among all nations for his name. And then in chapter 6, Paul says, 6, 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves to whom you obey, whether to sin leading to death, eternal death, or of obedience leading to righteousness, i.e. leading to eternal life. Right? Verse 17. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart, a heartfelt obedience. How many of you used to be slaves of sin? Anybody here? There's one. We got one, two, three. Oh, okay. Look at that. Their hands are popping up all over the place. Before we came to a knowledge of what God was expecting, God's will, God's truth, we, we just did what was normal, which was slaves of sin. We did what the world told us and taught us to do. And now, sadly, the, the world is teaching kids in school to be have their brains upside down before, before they're 8 or 9 or 10. It's crazy. So God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart. Wholeheartedly you obeyed. And that's how we should take unleavened bread. Wholeheartedly. Right? Um, and, and it's like, what, what is the deep, deep message of eating this crunchy bread? Now, if you, if you have matzos, Gary... Bless his heart. Gary used to get me my supply of matzos every year, right? And matzos are about this big if you haven't seen one lately, right? And they're as brittle as, um, they're as brittle as, I don't know, they're as brittle as brittle can be, right? And if you coat the whole thing with peanut butter and then you bite it, guess what's going to happen? It's going to explode. <laughs> and part of that peanut butter matzos are going to fall to the carpet upside down. So you've got to be careful with matzos. But, but, you know, it's like, oh, well, this is the days of unleavened bread. There's, there's lots of better unleavened bread you can get, which I had some this morning, right? Um, so Jesus told Paul to teach obedience to the New Testament, right? Um, regarding the, two, the New Testament Passover, on Passover, right? And that's where communion falls flat, because they do communion anytime they want. And they don't do it in the sense of it was Passover night. They read the Passover scriptures. Jesus was the Passover lamb of God. And we're looking for his to return to planet Earth, right? So, and then regarding the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which, which is, I think, the supreme test obedience after the Sabbath, right? The Sabbath is every week. And it means, you know, you can't work on Sabbath. Right, and, and you can't do a lot of the things you'd like to do on Sabbath. So you give up 24 hours a day, every seven days, Sabbath. But after a while, we get to love the Sabbath. Right? So it's no longer the, a big burn. Right? Okay, then unleavened bread is like, what I've got to do? 
you're going you're gonna to have a holy day on the first day, no matter when it falls. Today it happens to fall on a regular weekly Sabbath, so we get a double Sabbath to combine. But, but next, the end of this week, Friday, Friday is going to be the last day of unleavened bread, a holy Sabbath day, right? Two holy Sabbath days in a row, right? Oh man, I got to go 48 hours without doing the stuff I really like to be doing, right? So 1 Corinthians 11:25. This cup is the covenant of the new covenant in my blood, i.e. the way to eternal life. Do this in remembrance of me and my sacrifice. Luke recorded Christ's Passover words in Luke 22:15. With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Because that one day, he said that on the day he died, that one day, that 14th day of Nisan, right, was the pivotal day of all of eternity. All eternity past was coming down to this one day, and all of eternity future grows out of that one day, that Passover day, and that sacrifice. And if you're not in written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you die the second death, and you don't live into all eternity. If you are written in the Book, the book of Life of the Lamb, right, then you do live into all eternity. But it all came down to he had to willingly let himself be sacrificed and shed his blood and die, right? So Matthew shows it was the Passover cup on Passover night. He said they prepared the Passover. He took the cup, drink from it. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for the remission of sins, right? If you don't get your sins forgiven by God, then you pay the second death penalty. The wages of sin is death, meaning dead forever. God is using the first two annual holy festivals, i.e. Passover and unleavened bread, to test the obedience of those who wish to follow him. Now, which is the bigger test? The weekly Sabbath or Passover and unleavened bread? What do you think? How many people are keeping the weekly Sabbath who aren't keeping Passover and unleavened bread? They go hand in hand. Well, they do, but there are bunches of churches who refuse <laughs> to. <laughs> yeah, and Jews, Jews, yeah. right? They don't even accept Jesus, <laughs> right? The staunch Jews. It's like we keep Passover, right? We keep Sabbath, right? We don't want anything to do with Jesus. It's like, well, why waste your time, right? He's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the Passover Lamb of God. But anyhow, that's another story. But to me, and I think we could we could discuss it longer. We don't want to take the time. But but to me, once you get in the Sabbath routine and you feel good about it, and you say, God, look, here I am on Sabbath. But you're not keeping the annual days. And the annual days fall through the week, which means you have to get off work, which means you might get fired, right? So I would, I would suggest to you that the greater test of obedience is Passover, although they, they fake themselves into thinking they're doing it with communion, right? But unleavened bread is like seven days and two holy days. Most of the time they don't fall on, on a weekly Sabbath. Right, and then what I got to do? You got to eat. You must eat unleavened bread. I don't even know what that is. Right? Well, show me. I'll go. I'll buy some. Uh, quick, give me some unleavened bread. I'm sorry. What do you want? Right. Anyhow, God is using these as a test of obedience to those who want to follow Him. First Corinthians five eight. Therefore, let us keep the feast. This is New Testament. Almost everybody who reads the New Testament knows that 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 8 is in the New Testament. Let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So Passover is a huge trunk, chunk of God's truth. It's a piece of the truth. It's a big piece of the truth. In fact, if you don't do Passover... You're not eating the flesh and drinking the blood. You don't have eternal life. Boss said it. I didn't, that's not me. I'm just quoting the boss. And the only way, the only way, biblically speaking, for you to eat the flesh of Jesus Christ 
is that symbolic wafer, that, that little wafer of unleavened bread on Passover night, that's the symbolic way of eating his flesh. And, and drinking his blood is the little thimble of wine, Passover wine on Passover night. If you do it any other time, it isn't Passover, and it isn't what Jesus said to do, right? So, therefore, um, <clears throat> in sincerity and in truth, and then another big chunk, and this is, this is why I think unleavened bread is the greater test, the greater test of obedience, because almost nobody wants to do it, right? Um, they don't, that doesn't make any sense to them, right? And when we first started doing it, it didn't make a lot of sense to us either, I don't think. You know, each year we do it, we learn more, right? So how do people keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread with truth? Jesus is the truth. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, meaning the way to eternal life. Besides the obedience test, we spend seven days eating the thinking and the words of the bread of life. Right? Now, how do we know what Jesus' is thinking is? We read slowly and we read carefully what he actually said. We have red letter Bibles. That's a big help because that's a small amount. You could teach your teenagers to read the red letter part in, in every, year, every month. It wouldn't take you all that long just to read the red letter words, right? And then there's the words from the apostles, John and Peter and Paul and so on. Okay, John 8, 32. You shall know the truth, said Jesus, and the truth will make you free. And the people standing in front of him said, What do you mean? We've never been in bondage. We are free all the time. <laughs> And then you could hear the clank of Roman soldiers marching up and down the street. It's like, what are you, an idiot? <laughs> but I guess spiritually they were thinking we've never been in bondage, right? They were in slavery in Egypt, but whatever. Verse 36, therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Through, free through, first of all, knowledge and obeying the knowledge, right? Because most of us started keeping unleavened bread by the knowledge to keep it and then learning the understanding of keeping it. We, we didn't say, well, once I understand it, then I'm going to start keeping it. No, we, we obeyed, we did it, we followed the knowledge, then we learned to understand it. So pure truth makes, free from error, makes us free from error and trickery, right? And all around us, yesterday was Good Friday, right? And that means... A whole bunch of stuff to some people means nothing to me, right? Um, and then it's it's like Sunday morning. I'm not going to no, <laughs> guarantee. I'm not getting up before sunrise, folks. Sunday morning, and I'm not going out there and facing the east and waiting for the sun to rise. One because Jesus said not not to do it. There's Old Testament scripture that says he doesn't like it when you do that, right? And then it, it's not part of what he teaches, and what he teaches is what's to be done and not these other things that, that other churches have added in throughout the, the centuries. So unleavened bread eating reminds us that the bread in our mouths, I don't know how quickly you eat unleavened bread, but it's not easy to eat it quickly. <laughs> it, it's like, it takes, takes a little work. Right? It's better with peanut butter, and there's no rule against peanut butter on unleavened bread. <laughs> right? So um, when it's in our mouths, we should be remembering that it's not mixed with. It's unmixed bread. It's not mixed with yeast or leaven. It's not a mixture like all the other kinds of leavened bread there are. What? There's donuts, there's crackers, there's... Bread, there's cake, there's what am I missing? Croissant. Croissant. There you go. Way to go. My my French speaking daughter would love you for that. That's good. Right? So it's 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 a non mixture thing. And for the old testament people who didn't have God's Holy Spirit, it was like remember you were in slavery and bondage in Egypt and you came out of Egypt and you couldn't do your daily regular routine of yeasting the bread and cooking up the fluffy bread, the fun bread, the toasty bread, right? You had to eat 
unleavened bread because you, you were on the move. You were traveling. You couldn't be doing making the yeasted bread. So Jesus, the Jesus truth has no error mixed in with it. Right? And, and what do we see with most of the churches around us? There's a mixture of error. Right? In some cases, huge error. In some cases, medium-sized error. But God... Jesus lived a life of no error, no sin. Now how he did that, I want to see the video of how he did that from a boy of five years of age to say eight years of age. I've seen a lot of boys five to eight and man, they can't go two seconds. <laughs> well, maybe, you know, how many times a day does one of those young boys sin, right? It's like they point a stick and they shoot all kinds of people with a stick. <laughs> so Jesus never sinned. Fantastic. Unbelievable. Right? So 99% good bread that is mixed with 1% rat poison <coughs> is bad bread. If you offer that to people, how many people would say, oh, oh, this has got the rat poison in it. That's the one I want. <laughs> it can even be deadly bread. Right? Now, as far as living forever, eating the wrong bread is going to keep you from living forever until you get the knowledge straight and then you get the understanding straight and then the obedience helps with the wisdom. Then you get all three together and it's working and you understand that eating is eating and you're looking for truth. Now, you know, Church of God people need to look for truth too, understanding and truth. And, and there are people, there have been all kinds of people in the Church of God who came along with messages that were not true, and those people don't keep Sabbath. They don't keep Passover. They don't keep unleavened bread. They don't keep anything, and they eat unclean meats happily saying, Lord, Lord. We're in God's church. And they turned from doing the true knowledge to doing the false knowledge, the erroneous knowledge, right? So it's not mixed with error. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, test all things, hold fast that which is good or true. Verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. Right? And there's a, that's a tall order, a short verse, but it's a tall order. Eating pure truth bread knowledge for seven days should remind us to hunger for more and deeper true knowledge. That's, that's, you know, to me, I'm, I'm going to die before I've plumbed the depths of all the different things that I want to, you know. I, I start a sermon and I go, ooh, what's the Greek and what's the Hebrew behind this? And then I start adding things onto my computer and the message is like four hours long. And it's like, oh, wait, I can't do this. <laughs> I gotta I got chop this up, right? But but there's so many subjects I want to deeply study. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, as newborn babes. What do we all know about newborn babes? <coughs> helpless. Okay, helpless. What else? They're hungry. Aren't they? 99% of newborn babes are hungry. When? Once a day. All the time. <laughs> right? And Peter knew this. As newborn babes desire the pure, sincere milk of the word, the truth, that you may grow thereby, as young children, young babes do grow. Greek definition there of that word, 90 G, G97, is undeceitful. We almost never use the word undeceitful. It's just not part of our language. It's, you know, it's a word, right? Or unadulterated. Now, we do use that word, right? And then they translate it sincere. Why couldn't they, why couldn't they have put up here instead of, right? And, and remember it says, uh, the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. It's that G97. Why couldn't they have put undeceitful instead of sincere? Because sincere sounds better. Right, uh, and it, it doesn't lean towards unleavened bread, right? And unadulterated, 
during the seven days of unleavened bread, if you mix leaven and yeast in with your bread, guess what? It's unadulterated and it's sin. And there's another thing about the days of unleavened bread, which is hard to explain to people, right? Because leavened bread is totally, totally not sin, right? Depends what you put on it, but right? For 350 something days in the year, and God magically says, because God is God, for seven days, my seven days, not anybody's seven days, but my, says God, my seven days, if you eat leavened bread for those seven days, you are practicing sin. Now you go outside and try and explain that to a church person or a non-church person. You mean to tell me that fluffy, toasty bread... <laughs> is sin for seven days but it's not sin for all the rest of the time that don't make no sense at all it's a lesson plan and you have to have the knowledge and then you have to have the understanding and then you have to apply the wisdom Thayer's definition says unmixed or unadulterated and we saw that up there um, every time we bite into unleavened bread we need to be remembering that only unmixed truth knowledge will set us free to eternal life if we start mixing in error with the truth, what are we going to have? We're going to have tainted, adulterated bread, right? Or knowledge. Part of the Unleavened Bread Festival is being careful not to eat any yeasted mixture bread. Now, halfway through the week, back in the old, my old days, I'd be driving around in a work truck, and it'd be lunchtime, and I'd be hungry. And I didn't bring my sandwiches with me. <laughs> You can't bring it, right? Okay, I wouldn't let, my wife wouldn't let me take sandwiches or anything that way, right? But you drive past the McDonald's. What do they have in McDonald's? Hamburgers! I'll have a hamburger, hold the buns. It's like, I'm sorry, what did you just say? Give me a hamburger with no buns. It's like, then I need a hamburger. Right? So Satan's goal is to deceive people away from God's truth. How's he doing? He's doing really well, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Satan is deceiving more and more and more people further and further from God's truth. Revelation 12, 9. The, I love this verse. It, it's very clear. The great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old in Garden of Eden, right? Called the devil and called Satan. <laughs> uh, any, any confusion as to who we're talking about? <laughs> I mean, this nails it, right? who deceives the whole world. Hello, that's where we are. We have a thoroughly deceived world. Now we've got Google. That helps him deceive it even more. Right? Through, through the symbolism of unleavened bread, Jesus is warning again and again and again not to be deceived. Is it easy to be deceived? It is, isn't it? Right? So, happy unleavened bread to you all, and remember, you should be eating the true wisdom, the unmixed true wisdom from Jesus.